Well, we're in a second week of a series called Simplify, and last week we started out talking about being overloaded, overworked, overwhelmed, and exhausted, probably things that every one of us can identify with, probably on a level greater than you wish you could. And uh, these things are things that I think most of us have experienced on some level, probably more consistently than we wish, and uh, the problem comes when this becomes the pattern for our lives. And uh, so the idea is, wouldn't it be great if we were able to extract those four words from our vocabulary, from our schedule, from our lives over this next year? And uh, that's what we're talking about in this uh, series. Uh, Last week, we talked about the danger of depletion. Uh, when you live life on full, you know, you've got the, the gas gauge is all the way on F, it's on full. You're full of God, full of love, full of relationships, full of physical energy. Uh, that's when you make your best decisions. That's when you pray your best prayers. Uh, that's when you're at your best with your family and you're, you're good with God and the world. And the goal for all of us, I think, as we enter into this new year would be to live as close to full as we can possibly get uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and otherwise. We can't stay there all the way full all the time, but we want to stay as close as we can. That would be our goal and the objective here. And so um, the danger is when we allow ourselves to get depleted. And truthfully, probably most of us have lived a lot of our lives there this past year. Uh, the empty gas gauge kind of reflects this uh, image in our own uh, lives. Sometimes we spend too much of our lives living in this danger zone. Uh, when you're empty and depleted and, and uh, at the bottom of the gauge, the fullness gauge, you, you need to realize that you're living in a very dangerous and an unhealthy place. Uh, my dad used to be the kind of guy that if the gas tank got below a half a tank, we had to go fill it up. Didn't want to take any chances, running out of gas, you know. And I used to, you know, as I started driving 16, 17, 18 years old, I never had much money. And so I was always at about a quarter of a tank or less, you know. And he, he told me, you're going to run out of gas one of these days. And uh, because living down low, it's a dangerous place. And uh, so I, I learned that lesson, but it didn't take until uh, t- I was about 40 years old. I finally ran out of gas once. But uh, I heard my dad right behind me, even though he wasn't there, saying, I told you, I knew this was going to happen 24 years ago. We started talking about this when you were 16 years old. But the, the deal is, when we get in this place, isn't it true that everybody around us knows it? I mean, we know it. We know we're there. But everybody else seems to know it, too. And uh, when you get there, it can be difficult to get out. It's almost like you get in a rut. And you're on this treadmill, and it's difficult to get off. And so we're going to you know, all be depleted at times. There's no question about that. Depletion could be the result of a rough week or a rough month or maybe even a rough year sometimes. The problem is when we settle into patterns... And this may be where some of you are living today. When we settle into patterns that have lasted for months, and maybe even in some cases, patterns that have lasted for years, living on E is no place to be. That could be our new slogan for the day. Living on E is no place to be, especially on a consistent basis. And so we have to take responsibility to develop some of our streams of replenishment that we talked about last week. To do that, we we can break out of this pattern. But we talked about these various streams of replenishment for our body, mind, and spirit. And if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go to thepoint.com where you can watch or listen online. Just go to thepoint.com and hear about those streams of replenishment that can refill and replenish our body, mind, and spirit individually. Now, I hope you've given some time to that. I have a feeling that probably some of you were here last week and you were thinking, you know, I need to think about my streams of replenishment. What are they? How can I enhance them? How can I increase them? And if that's where you were living last Sunday and you were thinking about that, and you were thinking about how to bring renewal into your life uh, since you know, we were together last, I'm happy for you. But here's the thing. If you sat here last Sunday morning, or if you listened online or on the radio, and you said, hey, I'm going to do that, and here we are seven days later, and you still haven't done it, I want to ask you why. I want you to step back and think about why did I not have time in the last seven days to consider the streams of replenishment that are flowing into my life? Was I I just too busy for that? 
I don't have five minutes. I don't have 15 minutes to consider something so important. See, the problem is we often try to pass the buck and we're blaming everything and everybody, but we have to take responsibility for the refilling of our spiritual, our relational, our emotional, even our recreational reserves. And as I said, the goal is to keep our tank full rather than operating on fumes like so many of us do so much of the time. Um, last week, the focus was on exhaustion. Today, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and our focus is going to be on the schedule. It's going to be on our schedule. People often say, well, I'm so busy. Our schedules are packed and overflowing, aren't they? And uh, the reality is we almost brag about it. We wear it like a badge of honor. I don't, I'll, I'll just have a moment of confession here. Somebody calls me up and, and uh, I answer the phone and I, I know that I'm not the greatest on the telephone. I mean, I, I must sound um, abrupt or harsh or tired or whatever because I mean, often people say, did I just get you, you know, did I wake you up? You know, and I sound like this a lot of the day. So it may be 11 o'clock, no, he didn't get me up. And uh, I think sometimes I seem distracted because I'm in the middle of doing something, I answer the phone and it'll be, um, uh, are you busy? No, I was just in the middle of my nap. You know, what do you think? Uh, you know, I mean, but do we, do any of us want to say, no, I'm not busy. I don't have anything to do. I was just sitting here twiddling my thumbs, hoping the phone would ring. You know, we kind of wear it as a badge of honor. Yeah, I'm busy. Got a lot going on. Very busy day, but what's up, you know? And that's the way that probably a good number of us live. It's, uh, you know, we live at this frenzied pace and we're rushed and hurried and, and it's become a way of life. And uh, we're addicted to adrenaline. It's like we can't slow down. And yet we have more time-saving devices at our disposal than we've ever had before in any part of the history of the world. And so why do we choose to live like this? And the bigger question is, what can be done about it? If you're living like this, what can be done about it? And maybe even more foundational to that, I want to ask you to consider how should we as Christians think about time? Have you ever given that any consideration? How should we as Christians think about time? I would suggest to you that Christians need to think counterculturally when it comes to how we manage our time. Um, it should come as no surprise that Christianity and culture rarely move together. Have you noticed? Christianity and culture rarely move together. Culture rarely, if ever, moves toward a biblical worldview. And so we're asking, you know, how should we think when it comes to managing our time? Well, in Ephesians 5, Paul talks about redeeming our time or making the most of our time. In the New American Standard Bible, in verses 15 and 16 of Ephesians 5, it says, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. How does it, what does he mean by living wise? Verse 16 tells us, by making the most of your time. Why? because the days are evil. And then the psalmist tells us that if we want to make our days count, then we'd be wise to count our days. We refer to Psalm 90, verse 12, often around here. Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. I want to ask you an important question this morning. How would your schedule look different if God was in charge? I mean, if God was in charge of putting together your schedule for this coming week or for this past week, how would your schedule look different than it, than it was or than it is for this coming week? Are, are you willing to give that some thought? And, and I would ask you to think about it. Is your current schedule really working for you? I mean, you know the answer. I, I have a feeling some of you say, no, it's really not, but that's what I'm stuck with. That's what I have to live with. And I, I know some of you are probably a little worried right now because you come to church and you're thinking, shouldn't we be focusing on something a little more spiritual than how we're going to arrange our day? But what if one of our most holy endeavors in life was how we manage our time? Is, is that even a possibility? What if one of our most holy endeavors, our holiest endeavors in life is about how we manage our time? See, managing your calendar and your schedule, it may be one of the most spiritual things you're going to do this week. And in some ways, I mean, drafting a new weekly, monthly schedule, it's like drafting a whole new life script. It's like adopting a new script for the rest of your life. 
That's because your calendar plays an absolutely critical role in developing who you will become as a person, as a Christ follower, as a parent, a family member, an employer, a spouse, an employee, a friend, you name it. And and I'm not exaggerating one bit. When you sit down to rewrite your schedule, you're making choices that I believe have far greater implications than probably any of us really stop to think about or imagine. That's why this series is so important. And so, in your notes, what if our schedules were less about what we have to get done and more about who we want to become? I want you to think about that concept for just a minute and really let it sink in to your heart and into your mind. What if your schedule, we won't even keep it general for our schedules, what if your personal schedule this week was more about, less about what you have to get done, your to-do list, the things that are out there that you feel like, I've got to get this accomplished. What if it was less about that and more about who you want to become as a person or as a follower of Christ? How would that change things? I mean, how do most of us put together our schedule anyway? Don't we just grab a piece of paper and start making a to-do list? Here's all the things I've got to get done today. Here's the things that I've got to get done this week. And so we just start writing it out. And sometimes it's at a feverish pace as fast as we can, listing all these things that have to be accomplished. Most of us start the list with what we have to get done. There are have-tos. And then when we get done with the list of have-tos, we realize there's little to no time left for our want to's. You ever been there? Got some things you want to get done this week that you want to do that would be meaningful for you, but you've got your have to's done and now you're out of time. No time left for the want to's because it's all about the have to's. And so then what happens is we put our head down and we grit our teeth and we say, God, help me pull this off for another week or another 30 days or whatever. And then you're going to sit down and you're going to try it again. And see if there's a chance then maybe to slide in some want-tos. And then again, it doesn't always work. And so for many, this scenario plays out month after month and year after year. And for some of you, I have a feeling it's probably been going on for a very long time. You know exactly, exactly what I'm talking about this morning. You can relate very specifically. So what are the, the priorities that make it to your schedule? Is it all about the have-tos? And are there ever any want-tos on that list? Do you ever get any of the want-tos in? Uh, All of those important work commitments, they make it to your calendar, but what about those things that replenish that we talked about last week? Do those things ever make the cut? I really hope this liberates somebody today. Uh, because here's what I believe. My weekly schedule should include some non-work responsibilities. Um, We really need to include some non-work responsibilities. This is how holistic our schedule can be. I would ask you to consider, are you willing to include God, prayer, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit when you put your schedule together? See, our tendency, and this is getting to be true younger and younger for teenagers, I think, certainly college students, our our tendency is to try to crank out more and more work. We want to be more productive. We want to try to keep cramming in more and more and more. And the question is, have you ever stopped to think about what investment is it going to take for you of time to be the person you want to be? What investment of time is it going to require for you to be the husband or wife that you feel God's calling you to be? What investment of time is it going to take for you to be the mom or the dad that you really need to be and want to be? What's the appropriate time investment to accomplish the most important things of life? Now, the questions are going to vary from person to person, I think, to some extent. And I think the answers vary from person to person as well. Uh, That's because there's no 100% right answer for everybody every time. But your answer to these questions, they could even change over the course of the years because of the age of the children and life stage that you're in and, and your job and different things. But are you willing to try to muster up the courage to get it right? 
I mean, to really muster up the courage to get it right when it comes to your calendar and when it comes to your schedule, when it comes to time. I mean, what if words like home, family, marriage, personal spiritual growth, what if those kinds of commitments made it to your calendar just like an important meeting at work? That's the power of a schedule. It's almost supernatural when you stop and think about it. Is it possible? Think about this. Is it possible that the destiny of a little three-year-old girl or a little 12-year-old boy or a couple of teenagers, is it possible that their destiny could change because of some commitments that you made as a result of being here today? Could it make that much difference? I mean, just a word in a time slot, on a calendar, a schedule that you decide to live out. See, what we're talking about is the power of a commitment. That's what it means to put something on your calendar. When you put something on your calendar, you are making a commitment, a commitment of your life. You are making major life decisions. You are dedicating a portion of your life to that person or to that activity or whatever it is. And by default, when you make that commitment, you are denying something else. Because there's only so much of you to go around. There's only so much time to dedicate. And so when you commit to one thing, you are denying something else. I cannot commit to be in two places at once. I can't attend two separate meetings at the same time. I remember early in our ministry, there was a pastor friend who told me, he said, Steve, if you are ever expected to be in two places at one time, one of them is not an obligation. <laughs> I thought that was good counsel. One of them is not an obligation. You don't have to be at one of those places. Well, thank you, Jesus. I, I've been liberated, you know, because I felt like I ought to be everywhere and do everything. But if you're expected to be in more than one place at a time, you can't do that. The implications of this really are huge. What do you want to become in the next season of your life or maybe better said who do you want to become and and it may not be as hard as you think because sometimes I think we sit back and think I don't know I don't know if I can do this well most of us have already mastered this on some level already I mean you've th this is the good news let me encourage you for just a minute because for instance some of you decided to become maybe a an engineer or a nurse or, or whatever and you decided what was required and you just blocked out the time and did it You've already mastered this on some level. In the simplest of terms, you decided what you wanted to do. You put it on a calendar. You went to school. You took the classes. You studied for the test. You passed the test, and you achieved your goal. That's how most of us made it to where we are today, isn't it? What was so hard about that? Don't answer. That was a rhetorical question. I don't want to know. We've done this. You've done this. You decide to put something on your calendar, you show up, you do the training, you take the test, you go to the class, whatever, you achieve your goal. And in a general sense, almost anybody can do that. It's the power of a schedule. It is the power of a commitment. That's how some of you changed your career path. You decided to make a change. You found that there was a night class that was going to be meeting. You put it on your schedule. You made a commitment to attend the class for the next few weeks. You showed up. You did the work. And 104 Monday nights later, you had a new degree. Some of you could just stand right up and testify right now, couldn't you? Because you've done that. Your whole life changed because you put something on a calendar. That is the power of a commitment. The power of a word that's written on a schedule or on a calendar and then lived out, it cannot be overstated. And so what I want to do here in these next few moments is I want to make some very practical application that will apply to every person in this room on some level. You've seen this weekly three logo, I'm sure. It's in the worship folder today, and we talk about this a lot around here. Uh, we encourage three weekly commitments. You can see them there at the bottom of the screen, worship, connect, and serve. Um, are you willing to invest an hour a week in each of these three areas? To worship, to connect, and to serve. Um, the first question I would ask about that is, have you set aside time on your calendar for worship? Now, I assume that you have, or you wouldn't be here this morning. 
You made a plan to be here. You had decided that you were going to show up. And so it's on your calendar. And I am talking here about Sunday morning services. You've decided, hey, I'm not going to flip a coin on this to see if I'll show up. I'm not going to wait to see if something else comes along to fill this space because don't we all know it will? I mean, if you wait to see if something's going to come along to fill this slot on Sunday morning, it's going to happen. And uh, if, if somebody, if, if that space is going to be filled, I wonder who's behind that program. I think Satan loves it if he can get you to fill your schedule and your calendar with all kinds of other things away from God. But if worship's not a priority, something else is going to fill that space. And I love what Jesus or Luke says about Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He talks about Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. That was the model and the pattern that Jesus set out before us. Personal worship is a priority that deserves space in our schedule. It, it was a priority for Jesus, and it is worthy of priority time in your schedule, not the leftovers. And it goes back to that question, who do you want to become? I mean, if you have even the vaguest interest, interest in becoming a more dedicated follower of Jesus Christ, if you want to be someone who knows a little more about spiritual things, if you want to be somebody who feels a little more deeply about the things that move the heart of God, someone who has a little more spiritual direction in your life, there are a couple of things you ought to have on your calendar, and that is, you know, worship, corporate worship and private worship. Corporate worship is worship like what we're doing here today as a group. It's church attendance. And then private worship is personal devotion. I mean, what would it be like for you to sit in a chair that you like at home or at a desk or at a table and open God's word and then read his word for 10 or 15 minutes and try to make application of what you've read to your life and then to thank God for his word and say, Lord, is there anything you want to say to me? Because if you want to speak, I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to obey. How can I apply what I've read to my life today? Can you, can you find at least 15 minutes a day to do something like that in your life? See, the power of words in time slots on a calendar and lived out can change who you become. And, and I just feel compelled to appeal to every person in the midst of the going and the doing and the experiences that you want to provide for your children, I just want to encourage you to make sure that worship is at the top of that priority list. Because spiritual things, including worship, they need to be a part of that priority because otherwise there are so many things, you just mark my words, there are so many things that are going to crowd it out. They're, they're going to nudge it out of the way. So many activities and events and so many voices that are competing for their time and attention. And I just want to encourage you to make sure you lead your children in this area because you have a moral and biblical and spiritual responsibility for their soul. And uh, you have to make sure you make these days of influence count when they're young. Because one of these days, one of these days, your opportunity to influence these decisions will be greatly diminished. And you can decide if you're the parent of a young child or a teenager right now, you can decide today, I'm going to make sure I have no regrets when that day comes. Show them what's important. Make sure they know not only by your words, but by your example, what matters most in life. Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings, you have a team of partners who are here to help reinforce the messages that you want your children to learn and apply to their lives now and for all eternity. Be sure that you make time for worship. Secondly, I would ask, have I set aside time on my calendar for connection? And see, our mission as a church is to point people to Jesus and to connect with each other. And we want to help develop relationship first with God and then with other Christ followers. And so we do that through the gathering. We do that through small group Bible studies. And uh, here's a list of all the current classes that are available right now on Wednesday nights uh, from 6.30 to 7.30. Every Wednesday night, there's seven adult options that are available. And every one of those offer a place where you could plug in and grow and connect with others and connect with God. Third thing I would ask, have I set aside time on my calendar to serve? This can uh, be through your church. It can be through your community, your work. The key is that you're setting aside time for others. You're thinking about others. That's what serving is all about. 
You can set aside time to volunteer for some ministries here in the church. You can do some things out in the community. And the way to get to where you want to be this year is words in time slots on a schedule that are lived out. That's the way you get there. You get there by putting words in time slots on a schedule that are lived out. Day in, day out. That'll make a difference. So, I have a challenge for you. This is going to sound a lot like homework. If that gets under your skin, don't think of it like that. But if you want to take another step in today's message, here's what I would want to encourage you to do. This is the pastor's challenge. Draft a God first schedule this week. What would that look like for you to draft a God first schedule this week? And instead of starting out with all those things you've got to get done, I want you to start thinking about who do I want to become? Who do I want to become? And then put your schedule together. Put in those plans, those engagements, those relationships or activities that will lead you down the path of who you want to become. You'll never become the person you want to be unless you put some commitments on a calendar and live them out. And there's some things to think about as you, as you get that schedule started for the new year. As you think about being the person that you want to become, uh, there are some things that need to be added to your calendar. There are going to be some things that need to be removed from your calendar. It's not just about adding. It's about taking away. It's about being strategic. For instance, I know many of you have never experienced a peaceful relationship with money your entire life. You grew up in a family that was in financial chaos. And then you went to school, you racked up a bunch of debt, you got married. Uh, then your husband and wife or, or wife had the, the, their own ideas about money. And then you bought a house and then you bought a car and then you bought another car. And now you're scrambling to make ends meet. Some of you have only known financial anxiety your entire life. And you secretly wonder when you hear us talk about it, is financial peace even a possibility? Well, Financial Peace University is coming up uh, nine consecutive Fridays beginning January 19th, 2018. And I just want to ask you, is that something you need to add to your calendar? Maybe some of you have thought about doing it for years, but you've just never done it yet. But this could be a decision that could change your life. It could change your future. It could change your family, family legacy. There are things on your schedule that are less important than this. Would you be willing to set them aside for nine weeks so that you could make time for something that matters more? Are you willing to remove those things in order to make space for something that could impact your life in such a tangible way? It begins by saying, who do I want to become? And if you want to become somebody who's not so anxious about money all the time, if you're looking for some financial peace, maybe you need to put FPU on your calendar. And I know some of you, what you're thinking, you're thinking, Steve, you're making this sound so magical. All I got to do is put it on a calendar and something magical is going to happen. Well, why don't you just try it? Why don't you just see? You might be surprised. One other example would be date night. Some of you, you know, happily married couples often testify to the importance of having a date night. Some not, sometimes it's every week. Sometimes it's every other week. But a number, a high number of happily married couples have made that commitment. They have it on the calendar. They don't miss it. They don't flip a coin. And it's who they want to become. They, they want to become increasingly happily married. So they put it on their calendar and they have a plan. Who do you want to become? Now, um, some of you have heard me talk about a wedding gift we received several years ago. And I'm, gonna, I'm jumping because there's a hundred other things I could talk to you about in regard to things you could be putting on your calendar. I'm asking you to say, Lord, show me. And I think probably most of us intuitively know what needs to go there. But several years ago, we, we received, well, it'll be 34, five years ago this summer, we're getting ready for our 35th anniversary. We've got this plaque, and I still find it comical that it, it would, to, be, to me, our most prized wedding gift is a wooden plaque. Um, it's about that big, piece of plywood, and it's decoupage. And it's got a sheet of uh, the scripture over it. And it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Now, that was not an expensive gift. But I'm telling you, it has had, that verse has had a significant impact on our lives. I, I wish I recalled who gave it to us. I don't. Uh, lots of people, though, can quote that verse. But not as many choose to live it. And I want to tell you one way you can choose to start living it is if you redraft your schedule and you seek God first with your time and your schedule and your calendar. 
And so here in week number two of Simplify, I want to ask, do you want to become a God first person? We talk often about putting God first in the area of our finances and the tithe and our first fruits and the first 10%. But I'm telling you, this verse has application to our calendar. We can choose to give God the first minutes of our day. We can choose to give God the first day of the week. We should include God in our calendaring. That's my appeal to you today. We should include God in our calendaring. There are all kinds of things that you need to add to your calendar this year, but if you keep adding to your calendar without taking some things away, you'll never find the simplicity that God desires for all of us. He's not into chaos. He's not into bondage. He's not into burdens. He's not into chains. He is into peace and balance and priorities. And this is about asking God to help us prioritize our time by being a good steward of the time that he's given us, the best steward we can possibly be, making the most of our time. It's about counting our days to make sure our days count. And as I said, there's way more that could be said. I hope some seed has been sown. I I believe God is faithful. He'll speak if you'll listen. And uh, the question is, is he leading you to invest some time in your family, in your marriage, in your personal spiritual development? Is it time to plan a family vacation? You know, it, you know, there's so many things. Don't give yourself, don't give your marriage, don't give your family the leftovers. Make time, set priorities. Think about who you want to be in 2018. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word, which talks to us about time and reminds us that we only have one life and it's going by so quickly. And most of us know that. And I think deep down inside, none of us here want to waste it. Most of us are pretty good, though, at filling our schedule with stuff that doesn't matter that much. And so we get hurried and frenzied and worrisome and and we get all wrapped up in this stuff. We, We want to be God first kind of people. And so I pray that you would help us each and every one to live out the potential that you have placed within us. Help us to have wisdom, to know what do we do with what we're hearing here today. We've heard a lot, and I know that we could walk in and out of these doors every Sunday and go home and nothing changes. I pray that won't be the case. Not because of anything I've said, but as your spirit has spoken, I pray that we would be able to walk out of here and make application of these truths and we would have wisdom to know how to do it and then the courage to do whatever it is, to make a difference in our lives on every level, emotionally, physically, mentally, socially, relationally, recreationally, in every way. We want to honor you in our schedules, our calendars, and our time for the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.